Hello, I am Casey Davis. I am a flight controller here at LASP, and I work on the XP mission. Tell me about your interest in space. My interest in space is not a cool romantic story, I think, like most people have. I mean, I've always wondered about space and the dark night sky and things like that, but I, I got more interested in space through art and doing art and studying art and the art that I was creating was very abstract expressionist art that had a tendency to kind of echo what space images look like, nebulous things, galaxies, stars. And I, I kept hearing that in my art critiques and it slowly piqued my interest in things, outer space and the universe. And also everything that's out there is very not understood and not known. And a lot of my art was trying to poke at things that aren't understood and are not known. Or I used art as a way to ask questions about things that we didn't know. I tried to use it as um, an avenue to access things that were not necessarily accessible in our tangible reality. That was a very art student answer, I think. But <laughs> space. But you did get your MFA. I did receive my MFA. Um, and yeah, that feels like a lifetime ago. Uh, but the work that I did for my MFA had to do with this tangible reality and virtual realities and trying to understand how art can be a street way for those two things sort of working in parallel with one another. I did a lot of work with video games. I was interested in what a reality is in a video game in a virtual space versus a tangible reality in my livable physical reality and how those two things can come together. And it was exciting to find a way like me existing in a physical reality, um, being able to access an untouchable, unknown physical virtual reality through gaming and through art, using art as a way to make marks to represent a virtual reality. I feel like this is getting really meta <laughs> really fast. Why did you decide to go a different direction? So I, it wasn't a f very clear cut decision. Oh, I'm ditching art and moving on to science um, or STEM in general. It, I, I wasn't, being fueled by art, well, by the community mostly. Um, I'm a very curious person and a lot of the people I had discussions with in art were curious about art and what art can say, but I think I was a little more curious about what art can start to say, if that makes sense. And I was interested in those conversations that were like right outside of like the thin gray line of what art is and then where art touches the unknown and the unknown things in our own reality. So I think that not getting, I think my inability to have conversations with people about the weird stuff I was super curious about. What is our universe? Why am I here? What is reality? What is happening? I, no one, not a lot of people like to talk about those things or those are difficult conversations to have. And I found that exploring something as wide open as space you you have no choice but to be around people who are willing to butt heads with those big, large, serious questions because you have to like that. That's that's astronomy. That's that's astrophysics. That's figuring out these things that I have never seen anything like this before. What is it? Let's figure it out. Let's let's do some tests. Let's let's just watch stuff. Let's gather data. So it was a slow transition into a community that better supported me. It's a long answer. Tell me more about this community. I think that 
Everyone in the community for sure has those questions. And I didn't show up to see you and was like, hey, do you wonder what's out there? Because me too, thanks. It wasn't anything like that. It was more, there's like a mutual understanding that everyone is curious about all of these things because we're, we're studying it. We're trying to figure out how these things work. Um, and something I found in that community other than that large curiosity that I didn't really find in the art community was these, these people think the same way that I do. They get excited about the same things that I do. And we have a lot of mutual interests as well, which was something that I didn't have in the art realm that I didn't think was that important. But I mean, you just heard the R2D2 thing go off in here a second ago. And I told you we're nerds. And like, that's, that's, that's something that, I am, which it didn't really, some people can make it work in art, but I think that socially I'm a little, <laughs> a little more challenged and um, nerdy, if you will. And it, I couldn't find that community in art and that's okay. Um, there, the, the community probably exists. I just didn't look hard enough, but I found a great place in like the the space and astronomy and STEM community is just a bunch of people who are really excited to figure things out and are chasing after answers. Was the transition from an MFA to a STEM degree easy? So the transition from going from fine arts to STEM was not space rainbows and unicorns. Uh, I only went as far, I only needed to take up to college algebra um, in fine arts. And so moving on to a STEM degree, one like astronomy, where you have to understand a lot of geometry and spaces, I had to take through, well, Calc 2. Um, I took Calc 3 for funsies, but that's fine. Uh, anyway, I had to start in pre-calc. And my very first pre-calc quiz, I failed. And this was my first week starting back as like a non-traditional student. And I was like, I can't, can't hang with the kids. I don't have the beefy brain for this uh, major. Um, it was not easy, but a lot of that was just learning how I, I had to learn how I learn because in art, everything is um, more subjective. Um, and I am pretty good about knowing what I want to talk about and what I understand and the things that I want to explore. There's a difference between studying art things and studying STEM things where you have to learn mathematics and patterns and physics and just sort of use all of these abstract things and apply them to difficult problems. It does kind of parallel art in that a little bit, knowing what you know and, well, I applied it to the problem of what is existence. But STEM is just a way to answer those difficult questions in a very concrete black and white way, which I think is super interesting. What challenges did you experience? Uh, one of my biggest challenges, math was kind of like a fun challenge, um, like frustrating, but fun when you finally solve a problem. My biggest challenge, I think, was actually coding. And that relates to my experience at LASP. I had actually gone through the summer training to be a command controller, um, but ended up getting cut from the crew. I don't know, That's that doesn't put it very lightly. Um, but I it was because I had not yet learned how to learn. I had not studied physics. I had never taken a coding course. And the things that you learn in the summer training program are very aerospace heavy and just, um, well, at least when I went through the program, it was too much information at once for me. Coding ended up being my big downfall just because I had never heard of, well, I'd heard of coding, but I'd never seen a language, had never done anything myself. And it is what I was four questions shy of like passing a certification test and it was coding questions, every single one of those questions. So coding led to my downfall. So I was like, I will learn to code and it will never keep me from anything that I want again. 
And here I am now. <laughs> How was coding challenging? Challenge, the biggest challenge that I faced in my summer training program was coding. I had never, I had heard of coding, but I had never seen it before. I, I had never written in a language and actually I, coding wasn't really my biggest downfall. It was actually me and me getting in my own head because I was just getting caught up on really abstract questions. Like what is an array? Like, what does that mean? And I was trying to like, think of, I guess I was too, you can't be philosophical with coding. I just got very excited about all that stuff. Anyway, coding, it was just a brick wall for me. I hit a brick wall and failed there. And that's why I didn't continue as a student at LASP. How did you respond to being cut from the program? I was very mad. <laughs> Not at LASP, um, mad at myself and mad at coding. And so because coding had caused me to hit a brick wall, I wanted to break through that brick wall and never have it exist anywhere in my life again. So I actually enrolled in a course at CU in the APS department. They offer a scientific programming course that teaches you the basics of coding. And I decided to just start there and get past that brick wall that had kept me from getting where I wanted to go before. Never again. <laughs> Is there anyone who helped you overcome your challenges? I, so in enrolling in that course in the APS department, I was very nervous just because I was still really tender from having lost the opportunity at LASP and was nervous that I was going into something that I know I had catastrophically failed at previously. So I was getting into touch with the professor, even I think he made a pre-course survey like, have you worked in code before? What languages have you heard of? And I was like, I worked in this and I failed miserably. Am I going to do okay? Is everything going to be all right? <laughs> do you think I can do this? And he just, Zach Berta Thompson of the APS department, um, just encouraged me and just set the stage for me that I had all the tools that I needed to succeed and encourage me that everything would be just fine because we're just stepping through things like in bite sizes and it wasn't going to be anything like what I had experienced. I was also working in a really like archaic language. Um, sorry, ideal fans. Uh, but Zach Berta Thompson, I don't know if he knows how large of a role he played in helping me get over that, the brick wall of code for me. So, yeah. What was it like to come back to LASP? Um, what does the song Chariots of Fire sound like? Is, or <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, true Chariots of Fire. I felt like a champion. Um, I was so determined to come back here too. I was annoying, I think, about getting back here. I kept my foot in the door the whole time, despite having failed out of the summer training program and kept in, in touch with uh, the person who ran it for the students. And just, I, I used her a lot as a reference even, and she even told me, she was like, just so you know, not everyone understands our training program. So when you use me as a reference for a job that you were fired for, not everyone's going to understand that. I was like, I don't care. I'm, <laughs> you're my reference. If they don't understand it, that's their own problem. I stayed in touch with her. Um, and I think that keeping my foot in the door here and proving to myself that I could overcome that hump of coding, um, the coding skills actually that I gained had a large role, I've been told, in why I got the position here. Um, just because it's something I could do that a lot of the candidates, I guess, weren't as familiar with. So it ended up, because I decided to climb over the brick wall, that ended up serving me well and allowing me to end up here again. And 
coming full circle like that. I'm at like a loss of words to describe how that feels. Uh, uh, redemptive, <laughs> uh, exciting. I feel very proud and like really lucky. No one that never, I feel like people don't get to experience things like that. Unless they go after it, I guess. I was, I, I made sure that I would end up here again. <laughs> That's all I got. <laughs> Tell me about XP. XP, XP is, should I say what it stands for? Sure. XP is <laughs> the Imaging X-ray Polarimetry Explorer. It's a NASA small explorer mission. So it's like budget mission, but like it's also expensive because it's a NASA, NASA mission, but it is a it's essentially an X-ray telescope and it's looking it's in a low Earth orbit. So it's orbiting Earth and it's looking at exotic space targets. Last week we looked at a magnetar, which is very exciting. It's like a um, there's an, uh, it's an X-ray pulsar system. There's a neutron star that has a very strong magnetic field. Um, it's looking at pulsars, neutron stars, black holes. Right now it's pointed at the center of the Milky Way galaxy, looking at Sagittarius A star, which is our home black hole. Um, it's looking at astrophysical objects that emit X-rays. And it can see the polarimetry is the big thing about XB. Uh, so in physics, you can have a speed, which is just like a, a line measurement, I guess you could say. You can have a speed and you can have a velocity. And a velocity takes that one line measurement and adds a dimension to it. So you can go from just a speed to a speed in a direction. So it's sort of a two part measurement. Polarimetry with imaging, you can have an image, which is a visual thing. You can have the polarimetry of that image, which can show the direction of the photons that you've captured. No mission, no satellite has measured things like this before. So that's why XB is super exciting in looking at all these famous um, space objects. Like we looked at the Crab Nebula last week, which was it's an infamous astronomical object, like people in 10 something AD recorded it in their, I don't know, on their papyrus paper <laughs> of a new star appearing in the sky. And so XB is looking at these objects that we've known about for a long time, but it can take a new measurement on these things. So being able to see the polarimetry of an object can do things like show you the structure of the magnetic field of an object, which starts to get super important for things like black holes that are spewing jets that have these magnetic fields that get so tangled up and they're just like flinging stuff everywhere. XB is very exciting. It's best satellite. <laughs> what is your role with XB? My role with XB is I'm a flight controller. I explain this to others as a glorified spacecraft babysitter if I don't want to explain too much. Um, but I sit on console with XB um, anytime. We have a lot of automation for passes, but anytime that we need to do some commanding for XB, I'm there to do that. And I usually have a command controller there to help me. They're the ones who actually send up the commands. I say, please send these commands. I don't always say please, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so I monitor the health and safety of XB and help get um, just general scheduled commanding products up to it, like telling it when to turn on its transmitter because it's going to be in view of one of our ground stations, stuff like that. Is it a lot of work? It's hard for me to gauge if it's a lot of work because I just finished school in a STEM degree, and that was a lot of work. Um, but now as a professional, 
I don't have exams. I don't have homework. I don't have to go to office hours. It's it. So work is just work. And then I get to go home and not do work anymore. So I don't, if it is a lot of work, I sure don't notice yet because I'm having a lot of fun. <laughs> what makes it worth it? What makes all the work worth it? I would say I'm really excited about all the stuff that Ixby's looking at. Having studied astronomy, like these are all the things that got me into astronomy that helped me transition from fine arts to STEM. Ixby's actually looking at those things and actually adding to all of the data that scientists get to look at to find out more stuff that we previously did not know. So to be part of that, uh, part of that line of getting data to the scientists to find out more makes me feel like I'm contributing to finding answers to the unknown, which is what I had been searching for in art. I couldn't quite get there in art, but I'm literally doing it with Ixby. It's, that is quite rewarding. Plus I apply a lot of like coding knowledge. So it feels really good to be able to do that now because <laughs> I couldn't before. I've learned a lot. <laughs> Tell me about XP's launch. Uh, it launched at night, which actually is super exciting. And I hadn't really considered that until now because launches during the day are cool. Cause like you see the rocket and smoke or whatever. And you like feel, I wasn't physically there, but I'm assuming launch. Well, I've seen launches during the day on TV, uh, but XB launched at night, which means everything's more dramatic and everyone loves drama. Um, so bright engine lights, stuff like that. Um, I, I'll be honest, I was going to go to bed <laughs> instead of watch the launch, uh, but my partner convinced me to actually watch it. And um, I'm glad I did just because I was a little more nervous about what was going to happen on the launch pad than I realized. Uh, I did know that if Ixby had exploded on the launch pad, I wouldn't be out of a job at least, uh, because that's something I was thinking about when I had first started, like what if it explodes and everything ends? Uh, I need to knock on wood. Hasn't happened yet. It's fine. It's orbiting. It's doing great. Uh, I had never watched a spacecraft launch uh, as intently as I did for XB. I mean, I had seen YouTube videos here and there, but I never s had a set scheduled time like, okay, I need to turn on the NASA stream at this time to check this out. So I, I was very connected with the XB launch and seeing it go up uh, riding solo in its little Falcon 9. Well, Ixby's little Falcon 9s are not. Uh, it, it, it made everything feel real, uh, especially the camera on the side of the Falcon 9 when Ixby, uh, when it finally separated from the launch vehicle and just like slowly like floated away. And then it's little solar panels just like <laughs> fling out like birth. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm getting very excited again, thinking about that moment. Like, I don't know how else to describe the launch other than like, I joined the XB mission pretty late, but I still feel so attached to it and experiencing the launch is like, I don't know, I don't have kids, but I assume it's like seeing your kid off in life or something like, you know, they're going to do great things and you're just rooting for them. That's how launch felt. I do have a cat, so kind of counts as a child. Do you have any advice for someone thinking of doing a 180? My advice for someone that I feel like this answer would work for someone who's going from STEM to the fine arts we're going from fine arts to STEM. That is, that's, that's like 
180 degrees by definition. It's a really scary pivot. Um, my advice is just, if you're curious and if you're feeling pulled towards something, why, what do you have to lose from going after that? I, well, I, I, I've, talked about this before and I did have the luxury of pivoting from financially from one that was kind of eh, to one that was like guaranteed financial stability. Um, but there are plenty of ways to do that in the arts. I was just being stubborn about stuff. So, <laughs> um, I, I was, when I said, what do you have to lose making that pivot? I was trying to like counter argument myself and thinking maybe money. Mm. You can find ways to make it work. Even if you go from, from science to fine arts, um, you can still fall back on science things. Like I still do some art things. I was actually talking to my partner the other day about renting a studio. So you still have the other avenue as fallback or as fluff. I, I'm racking my brain here trying to think of like, what would you lose? Respect crossed my mind. That's stupid. <laughs> like, I, I don't know anyone who would look down on someone who went from STEM to fine arts or fine arts to STEM. I don't. What do you have to lose? There's nothing to lose. And that's it's scary, but that's part of what makes it exciting. And going for something new, challenging yourself, you're only going to reap rewards. I don't know. My advice is go for it. <laughs> what is your advice to someone trying to get into LASP? Uh, be annoying. I was annoying. Cold email people. I think that that is something that's kind of looked down upon which seems kind of silly to me because again, what do you have to lose? They're just gonna delete the email. Oh man, I'm so hurt. Wah, I don't I don't care. I'm gonna make people have to click the little trash can. I'm gonna be annoying. I want my name in front of your face. Also just LASP has a lot of opportunities um, for students and for professionals. And we, it's, the space is ever growing. Um, and the nice thing is if a pandemic hits, satellites don't get sick. So jobs still continue to grow and prosper here. Um, I would say if someone wants to get involved with LASP, just, I don't know, go, go to the website, check stuff out, click on links, email people, find names of people on missions that you're interested in and email them about it. What's it going to hurt? That's a good first step, I think. Just getting excited. You're probably already excited about it if you're looking up the website, maybe. Unless you're doing research and you don't want to be doing research. I don't know. <laughs> what early discoveries by XP are you excited about or confused by? Oh, man, I wish there were some discoveries XP's made that were confusing. XP's still a baby, little baby. Hasn't done a lot of science yet. Um... XB did release its first actual science image the other day, though. Um, it's of Casse, and I think the image, they did a composite with a Chandra image, which is like XB's grandparent, if you would, um, another X-ray observatory. Um, in terms of analyzing all the science data, not a lot has happened yet just because we're so early on in the mission. But in terms of the stuff that we're looking at and seeing, it's, I mean, we're seeing really cool stuff because we're looking at the coolest stuff in space, to be honest. So every image that Ixby is taking is exciting. Um, it's funny looking at the actual images, though, if there's not a visual uh, layer of the image on top of it, because then it, 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 I guess it could look kind of boring. Like it just looks like a hot, cool plot of like, ooh, it's kind of hot here. Ooh, it's really cold here. Uh, that doesn't seem very exciting, I guess. I think it's cool. Um, 
Yeah. Ixby's still so young that it hasn't been able to lend much yet just because people haven't had the time to like really analyze the data yet. But it's coming. <laughs> what do you like about CU Boulder? Um, what I like about CU Boulder, the location is really nice. Um, that's something that I've heard a lot of people say that, oh, you live in Colorado, you probably get tired of seeing the mountains. It's like, it never gets old. Maybe that's because I'm not native to Colorado. Um, coming from Kansas, there's not much to see. Um, maybe a tumbleweed or two, <laughs> some wheat. Uh, but seeing, just being on campus physically and seeing the flat irons and stuff is something that I did really like. Uh, I guess I can compare it to other schools I've been to. Um, well, the community is the best that I experienced um, just because that could be because I was in a major that really suited me. It also could be because CU Boulder really just does have the best community. Um, things that were available to me on CU Boulder campus I mean, this is also major specific, so it's a bit biased, but um, I heard Adrian talking about the observatory and the planetarium. I took my entire last year at CU Boulder, I lived in SBO observatory, working with the 20 inch telescope, telescopes, the 24 inch telescope and working downstairs in the computer lab. And I, being a part of that and having access to that stuff, like having the things at my fingertips that lets me look beyond things that my own human eyes can see was huge for me. Again, something art couldn't do for me, but that's a kind of a mean parallel to pull because I mean, you're comparing like what a human can do with mark making versus what technology can do with technology power. <laughs> I I also really like the Pico coffee shop <laughs> that's on campus. Uh, they fueled me through a lot, so shout out to them. <laughs> They're wonderful. Those are the things that I like about CU Boulder. Was it scary to go from having a job in the arts to going back to school? Was it scary to switch from having a job in fine arts to going back to school? Yes. That, I mean, that that's like, that's, I'm going to make a really drastic comparison here. That's like being a starving person being offered a plate of food and saying, Psh, I'm not hungry. Bye. <laughs> um, that's what that felt like. I, I had spent so long studying art, spent all these years, um, spent all this money in school studying art. And I had the whole career just like set up and ready to go. I just needed to press start. Uh, but I decided to abandon ship. Uh, that was very scary. Because I, I thought, what, what, if I, what if I don't make it in STEM? What if I fail out of school? I haven't been in school. I haven't done math other than basic algebra in like 10 years. What if, what if, I, what if my brain can't handle it? There was actually one point where I thought my brain couldn't handle it. I would get headaches after lectures, but it just turned out that I needed glasses. <laughs> so everything was okay. I thought, oh no, this is it. But no, it's okay. My eyeballs are just breaking. <sighs> but yeah, the scariest thing was just myself making up fears that were not necessarily there. Um, what if I don't make it? But yeah my strategy for dealing with stuff like that was to charge forward so hard and so fast that you kind of mute everything, all those second guessing and anxiety things of, oh, I'm not good enough. It's just like too busy. Got to solve this equation. Can't think about you right now. Sorry. <laughs> it was scary, but worth it. What was your first day at CU like? 
Oh, this is really good. Uh, so my first day, I, not even as a student at CU, uh, I was given a tour. It was a tour put on through the APS department by a professor where they just bring in prospective students, show them around the department, and then they take them on a little field trip to LASP. And I walked into LASP. It's, it's pretty intimidating and epic when you walk into LASP because they have all of these prototypes hanging everywhere and satellites. They have a really old satellite on display with like a little chain around it. They have a piece of space metal that you can touch that's been in space. And it was inspiring. I never thought that I would be connected with things like that, seeing things like that. I never thought that I was getting involved with something that would lead me down any sort of path that houses all of these super epic, crazy space things. Uh, it, it made everything feel tangible. It made things feel said inspiring already I'm trying to think I felt really excited and it felt like this is a place where people get stuff done and people keep getting things done and people want to get things done and want to keep going and pushing themselves I think that was the most significant thing it, it felt like I was surrounded by people who wanted to get somewhere and then go a step further and then a step further and further and further. That's very fun and motivating to be around. What was it like getting a summer job at LASP? When I, when I got the summer job for LASP as a student, I was sitting, I was working on calc homework actually and I got the email and I called my mom immediately and I was like they picked me I can't believe it I'm gonna work at the laboratory for atmospheric and space physics and I was very excited and she was very excited and I do remember well I didn't know how loud I was being in the hallway but I do recall getting looks from people because I was just I guess I was so excited that I was very loud um it was super exciting when I first um, got that position. Just be, it was an affirmation of you're, you pivoted and you're moving forward. You, you're doing it. You're doing the things. You're taking steps in this field. You're walking in a STEM program. You're a part of this community. Um, then they fired me. <laughs> Um, I, it was that, that was devastating. I was really embarrassed too, just because I had worked so hard to, um, make it in the STEM field and I had been doing so well. And it was like, all of that progress was just ripped out from underneath me because that felt like being fired from last felt like you you can't I mean these are the big leagues you can't sit with us essentially um that's what that felt like um then I just got not mad just like determined um if, if things frustrate me or make me angry I'm the type of person who uses that as as fuel like it it quickly will transform into determination. Um, so I was like, you know what? I got fired there because I couldn't code. So you know what? I will learn how to code and I will code way more than I was required to in that position uh, because I can. <laughs> and it worked out, it, mm -hmm, it worked out quite well. <laughs> What was it like coming back to LASP in a higher position? <laughs> uh, like coming back to LASP 
was amazing. I, I asked what Chariots of Fire sounds like uh, previously, but coming back to last in a position above what I had left for, um, that feels like a Beethoven epic. I don't know, <laughs> like if you think Chariots of Fire is good, well, just you wait. It, it, <sighs> it's really exciting. It feels almost, I almost said undeserved, but I worked so hard for it and I know I earned it, but ultimately it is so humbling. Um, I, I'm trying to put a lot of the energy that I feel for making it back here and like pouring that into working with other students and making sure that they know if they're struggling, I will do anything that I can to help them out. And like, I'm trying to pour all the energy and excitement that I have of being back here into like, helping any other student who is struggling or experiencing anything that I experienced, trying to help them overcome it because they can, if they want to. Um, and I'm living proof. What is your favorite space movie and why? Favorite space movie. Oh, I forgot. I was trying to think of the name of that other movie. Oh man. So favorite space movie is Interstellar until the end because <laughs> the end is cheesy and annoying, but I'm, I've never been one to like a happy ending really. Um, actually I just beat a video game the other day that had a very sad ending and I was like, yes, this is amazing. I didn't expect this. This is so great. I expect a happy ending. So it's like, I'm bored if I get a happy ending. And so, the ending of Interstellar was kind of like, okay, Matthew McConaughey, okay. Um, did you ask why? Favorite space movie and why? Oh, yeah. Okay. The reason that I enjoy Interstellar, a lot of it is because it does a really good job of um, illustrating uh, some complicated concepts uh, that can occur with exotic space objects like black holes. Like they do a really good job of showing you what relativity is. Um, they illustrate it very well and it feels very real just because, I mean, you have human actors portraying the feeling of experiencing um, difference in time because space time has been stretched. Um, the other good thing about Interstellar is that Kip Thorne, like the father of black holes in researching black holes actually worked with Christopher Nolan. He recently got a Nobel prize split three ways with a couple other people for all his work in black holes. But the fact that Christopher Nolan sought out knowledge like that. I feel like that's part of why Interstellar is so good and does such a good job of illustrating all of these crazy space things that are real, like that are, that are very much a part of our reality. Ah, loss of signal, rip. <laughs> I'm really excited about all the stuff that Ixby's looking at. Having studied astronomy, like these are all the things that got me into astronomy that helped me transition from fine arts to STEM. Ixby's actually looking at those things and actually adding to all of the data that scientists get to look at to find out more stuff that we previously did not know. To be part of that line of getting data to the scientists to find out more makes me feel like I'm contributing to finding answers to the unknown, which is 
what I had been searching for in art. That is quite rewarding.